have Kane or Sterling or Rashford or Foden or something like that. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 12.5 of the Short Corner podcast. Today, there's no Rid and there's no Naeem because they've unfortunately got other commitments. But I'm here with uh, Joe and Samir. Do you want to say hi? Hello. Hi, guys. It's good to be back. Yeah, welcoming Joe back because unfortunately he couldn't be on the last one. But yeah, again, Milan, I think as it kind of approaches like late July, early August, that's when we'll start getting back into the Milan stuff like transfers and um, yeah, other stuff like that and start focusing more on the preseason and going into the new season with Milan. But yeah, uh, this episode again, it's going to be some more, um, yeah, just some more Euro stuff because it's been such a great tournament and we just want to talk about it a bit more. So we're going to kind of have a look at the predictions we made when we were still in the group stage, so who we predicted to win and like if any of us made some bad predictions or if our predictions are like null and void now because certain teams are out. Um, and then, yeah, kind of going to go over the round of 16 because there was a lot of mental games in the round of 16, especially like the Spain game and the France game. And from a personal point of view, the England game was one I want to kind of talk about as much as possible uh, whilst I can because we'll probably get knocked out by Ukraine. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to preview the England game and the, all the other quarterfinals. And, yeah, as we really approach the business end of this tournament, just kind of, yeah, get some more predictions in. Um, in terms of predictions, uh, Joe wasn't on the lab, last podcast, so he didn't make a prediction. But, Samir, do you want to comment on your and yours and Naeem's prediction, uh, which is now null and void because you both predicted France? Yeah, um, I, I thought France would probably win at France or... Italy, you know, but then this whole tournament has been like unexpected, like every round, every match. It's been crazy. I, I really thought France would do a winner because their squad is just next level. They have all the positions. Well, except the left back position. Yeah, good on TCM for not bringing Theo. Anyways, <laughs> I feel like they lost because of, I think that the locker room is not, I feel like there's something going in the locker room. Like, news came out yesterday that Rabiot's mom was shitting on Mbappe because of missing the penalty. And then Baran blaming Pogba. Pogba blaming Pavard. It just, I think, and then Benzema coming back. Gerard was starting. It just, I think it's a mess. I feel like the dressing room is a mess. I think that's the main, one of the main reasons for them. And it just, the, 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 their formation, I don't know why did they play three at the back. Like, they were doing so good with 4-2-3-1. Like World Cup and like starting off the tournament, and they suddenly changed it, and I don't know, it didn't work out. Kind of shocked, honestly. So far, this tournament, to be honest, been much better than World Cup of 2018. Like hands down, every match is just it's just fun. You can just enjoy. And Joe, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting actually what you said about um, about France sort of like you know having some sort of like locker room uh, problems. Uh, because that's generally a running frame with, with France. So I don't know if you guys remember 2010, yeah. the, the World Cup, where they had like an absolute meltdown. I think 2006, I thought I'd actually remember that I was too young, but like, I think there was also some drama in that World Cup as well. So it's a thing with France. And it's one of the reasons they've probably done quite well is, you know, they, you know, for, you know, they, they dropped like, I think mean, Benzema for like several years because of like some stuff that happened. You all know what happened with Benzema, you know, but like, you know, like that sort of thing's the reason they've been quite good recently, I think, because they've managed to be more of a team and less of like, you know, all these individual sort of superstars that never quite get on. Um, but I mean, this was definitely France's tournament to lose. If, I mean, if they just bothered showing up like for 90 minutes in that game against Switzerland, they would have easily gotten through. But, um, you know, they, it kind of reminded me of the way that Italy approached the Austria game where they came in. And they kind of like, oh, we're Italy, we're the big team, we're just like, you know, all we need to do is show up and we'll go through. And, you know, they had to go the extra time. And it's the same with France. Uh, you know, they did sort of turn up. You know, it was, in a way, they didn't quite respect Switzerland and that was their, their downfall. I think um, my team to win the tournament uh, at the start, I'm saying this honestly, was uh, was Belgium. Uh, just because they just seemed to have this, the same sort of thing with France and that, you know, they've, they've got so much depth, there's so much quality all over the pitch and they only need to, like, turn it on for, like, 20 minutes. You know, we saw against, like, Denmark where 
they were outplayed for most of the game, but they just like, you know, decided to bring on the big boys and then all of a sudden, you know, they're free. <laughs> um, I think it'll be the same sort of thing against Italy. I mean, Italy looked really, really good. So I think whoever wins the Italy-Belgium game is going to be the winner of the tournament. Yeah, it's interesting what you both said about France because, like, if you think about 2018 World Cup, it was they were so efficient. They, as we mentioned, they're such a like great team, and I don't want to like completely blame Benzema because he's like it was their top scorer by a long way in the tournament. But yeah, it, it did seem as though with Giroud in there, they kind of had their sort of system. They had the dynamics right, and then yeah, as soon as Benzema came in, there was arguments with Benzema and Mbappe and Giroud, and, and yeah, it just all turned into like an episode of Love Island with all the drama and stuff like that, and in the middle of a tournament, I don't think there's ever been a team like during a major tournament who's had massive disagreements within the squad and won it and gone far. So yeah, a lot to think about France. They've got all the players, but they just need to get back to 2018 where they like kept it simple. They didn't change formation. They didn't bring in players who haven't been in the squad for seven years. And yeah, they kind of just chilled out, just went with it. And now they kind of overcomplicated it maybe. And yeah, for them, it's a massive shame to go out so early, especially to a team who on paper aren't as good as them. So um, yeah, um, was there any, uh, was another shock in that, uh, in the Rider 16 is Czech Republic knocked out Netherlands. Uh, Samir, do you want to give any thoughts on that? I don't know what to say. Like, I don't like Frank DeVore, you know, he, he never proved anything anyway, honestly. It was a bit shocking, but then, to be honest, all the Netherlands match, they like, like they won, but not like convincingly, you know what I mean? And I don't know, like, I, I watched like the second half of the match. I feel like they didn't try at all, the players, for some reason. Deepai was the best player. I feel like he didn't, he didn't even show up. So, I don't know, like, the Netherlands since last few years has been very lackluster, to be honest. I didn't really expect anything from them, and them getting kicked, you know, getting kicked wasn't real, was not, you know, a shocker for me. It was like, ah, man. <laughs> just, I know. mean, like, with the Netherlands, it's like, I, I think they've been, you know, they, I think that was honestly the worst Holland team I've ever seen, you know, in my life, to be honest. Like, they're usually, uh, they're usually pretty good. Uh, obviously, I haven't been at a competition for a while, and you can, you can see why, you know. And I think, you know, the, I don't know why the media sort of hyped them up as this big team that, you know, would have a chance of, of doing it. Like, you know, with Italy, it was a case of having a really, really crap manager. And that's why they didn't get to the World Cup, you know, and they had a meltdown at that point. And then they had a complete, like, national revamp on how they're going to think about football and, and all that stuff. But with <laughs> with um, with Holland, it's like, who do they have that's any good? It's like, their own is like assistant player in that midfield. He's a bit shit, to be honest. He's kind of overrated. Uh, Frankie de Jong has been shit ever since he got to Barcelona. Well, but not shit, but like, you know, I don't know, I just feel it's a bunch <laughs> of like really overrated players and like the media just needs to drop this idea that Holland are good at football because like they haven't been since 2010 really or even yeah. like 2014, whatever it was, they made it the semis. Yeah, you know, since like Robin and all that retired. So, I mean, I, I think they deserve to go out to be honest because they're really, really shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think with like Italy, as you said, it was was it uh, Gian Piero uh, Ventura, was it? And like yeah. you can kind of say like this Italy team should not not be going to a World Cup, and you could just pin it down on that one man, the manager. And I think that was fair. But with with Holland, uh, 2016 they didn't get to the Euros. 2018 they didn't get to the World Cup. Here they've gone out early against the underdog, and yeah, the 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 problems for them are so much more deep rooted than just a manager. I think, um, and then. Elsewhere in the round 16, I think not that much of a shot. Denmark thrashed Wales. Um, uh, we mentioned the Italy-Austria game, as Joe said, that was um, that was an interesting one because they kind of had that mentality. We've absolutely smashed the group stage. We can kind of just chill out. And then Austria put up a, like, a very good fight and made it very close and took it right to the final whistle of extra time. Um, Belgium, Portugal. Samir, do you want to give your thoughts on uh, Ronaldo and that kind of thing? Because there the, there's, there's the argument that he's choked it and then there's the opposite argument that it's not his fault and he didn't get enough support. And yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that match was really fun. You know, like really a fun match. I feel like it's not his fault that match, honestly. The entire team, they all were like very lacking. 
Like he didn't get, yeah. To be honest, he didn't get any support from the midfield at all, and and like he got like few chances, but they're not enough. And and to be honest, Belgium played really really well. Honestly, I feel I don't know. Like Bruno, is not really doing anything. Like in this tournament, he did nothing. This tournament, same with uh, what's his name, Diaz, from Manchester City. Even I, I was I was expecting something from him. I'm like, okay, they're like a really high player, you know, getting Ballon d'Or shouts every week. I'm like, fine, let's see what can they do. There is nothing in that tournament, like, like, and 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 the Andres Silva, you know, Andres Silva, the hype he got for scoring 28 goals. He did nothing. He shot nothing. He came like for like last 10 minutes, 15 minutes every match and did nothing. So I don't know. They just to me they're just all hype, nothing honestly. Yeah, I think with Portugal, it's similar to um, France in a way. What, like, if you look at the teams who have done well so far and maybe exceeding or matching up to expectations, they've all played as a team. England have played as a team. It's not individuals. Same with um, who else is in it? Just before I say something stupid, uh, Italy, they definitely played as a team. You can see the unity that they play with. Um, same with all the underdogs that have gone through. Obviously, Denmark have had to show in a lot of team spirit after what they went through with the Ericsson incident. But with Portugal and France, the teams who have underachieved, and same with maybe Netherlands, there's this sort of the, the squads in like loads of different pieces, and it's like not secure and it's not stable. Like you see, France, as we said, like there's disputes in that team. Netherlands, it's like they've not got a very strong like like there's like a couple of good players scattered everywhere, but they're not playing as a team. And I think with Portugal, it's the ultimate example of it. They've got Diaz, they've got Joao Felix, Bruno, Diogo Jota was doing well for Liverpool. Obviously, they've got one of the best players of all time in Ronaldo. They've got a decent goalkeeper and they've got brilliant players all around the pitch. But what have they got to show for it now? They've got nothing. And again, I think it's sort of that problem again where they've got all these good players but they've not played as a team and ultimately they've had to pay for it and yeah and the teams who maybe like you see teams like Ukraine and Czech Republic and Denmark and Switzerland they I don't think many of them were expected to go this far and the teams like Portugal and France were but you could see that their their efforts as a team and as a collective have shone through and that's why they've gone further than the so-called big teams and yeah, it's interesting to see that that sort of dynamic where perhaps in the past, like best players win is kind of maybe dying out. And um, yes, yeah, very interesting how it's played out. Um, yeah, Joe, go yeah, um, yeah, I mean, with, with Portugal, it's, I mean, it's quite interesting in that, as you said, they've got loads of like, really talented players. And I think they could actually be like, you know, they're, I think they're actually a much better team than they were in 2016 when they won the whole competition. Uh, and I think what the problem is, is that they have this sort of national identity that they score a goal and then they sit back. And the thing is, they don't need to do that. They've got some, they've got really good players like all over the pitch. They could easily just go and like, you know, play to properly win the game. But like, for some reason, they've they've always had that attitude. You know, anytime, you know, Portugal at any point in my life has always been the team that, you know, they're kind of like Italy, you know, traditionally, where they score and sit back, except they're not quite as good as Italy, traditionally. Um, and I think that, you know, the thing that happened to Italy after, was it 2018, when they failed to qualify, is they realised, you know, we're going to have to change the way we think about football, like, as a country, and they've completely, you know, they're playing attacking football, 4 free free possession, you know, And they're, and they're doing well because of that, uh, you know, because they, they've got this sort of national identity to the team. Um, and that, that's those, those teams are always the teams that do well. Like you think about Spain in 2010 when they, they had the, you know, they had the national identity of like the Tiki Taka sort of thing. And they won that. Um, you know, I think France less so much because they were, they were more just a group of like really talented players and like all the manager needed to do was just put them on the pitch. Um, Yeah, I think you're spot on with that, to be fair, that, um, yeah, there has to be some sort of consistency in the style of play and how you go about things. And there can't be an expectance that, oh, we've got Ronaldo, he's like top two players of all time, we're definitely going to win the Euros because that's not how it works. Um, if we want to move on to the quarterfinals now, um, obviously these are the two teams, um, Switzerland and Spain, who were part of the two most mental games 
in like Euros history and then matching up now. Switzerland obviously going through in that mental game against France and then um, Spain getting past Croatia in extra time, 5-3. Uh, I think Switzerland, they did very well, but they've not got Granit Xhaka, who I never thought I'd say this, but he's key to that his team. Um, they've, they don't, I can't imagine they'd be very, like, um, like as good as they were without him. So I think Spain will go through on that one. Um, Samir, do you want to um, have your input on that? Do you think Spain will go through? Yeah, Spain will go through. Um, I think against France, they got lucky because France kind of lost concentration, you know, towards the end. And 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 they are they going to play without Zaka? Uh, yeah, Xhaka got a yellow card against France, so they've they've not got him for the. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, then then definitely Spain winning it. Like I, I think it's this one's kind of pretty easy. Spain winning it. I feel like three three one three zero. And Joe. Hey, uh, so what were we talking about? Sorry, I had, a, I had an interruption there. Yeah, well, the the Spain Switzerland game, I think Spain will go through. Me and Samir do probably. All right, uh, Spain v Switzerland. Um, I guess, I mean, if Switzerland approached the game like they did against France, where they actually try to play, um, I think they have a chance, but. I actually think Spain looked really good. Uh, I think they're one of the favourites uh, for the tournament now. Uh, the only thing they lack is like a guy who can actually score goals. Uh, if they had that, they'd, I think they would be favourites. But um, yeah, I think they should have enough to get through Switzerland. But you never know. Yeah, I think that you can't write off Switzerland. They've just beat the world champions and like the team who got to the final in the last Euros and missed out now to Portugal. So Switzerland aren't a useless team. But yeah, Spain, I think you see it with a lot of teams, like teams who kind of like grow into the tournament. Spain like didn't do like amazingly got, what was it, two draws? Was it two nil-nil? But definitely two, no, I think it was a nil-nil and a one all um, against Sweden and Poland. But then they've grown into the tournament and now, and they beat Slovakia 5 0. They scored five against Croatia, Croatia. Maybe these teams who are grown into the tournament will be rewarded. And yeah, I think we're all pretty settled on a Spain with that one. Probably the biggest um, biggest two countries like in one game next Belgium, Italy at tonight, eight o'clock. That's going to be a, like, a fascinating game. I can't wait for it. Uh, Samir. I'd say I've gone with Italy to predict. I predicted Italy right from day one to win the Euro. So I'm not going to go back on it now. I'm going to back them all the way until they go out. So I think Italy will go through against Belgium. Samir, do you think differently? Or, yeah, what's your prediction? Belgium is a really, 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 really strong side. And if uh, Kevin De Bruyne starts today, it's going to be hard for Italy, you know. But that, I feel like Italy is going to go through. Like they've been playing really well as a team, you know. Like, I don't really see individual player for Italy. It's like an entire team. As a whole, they've been playing very nice. Mancini is doing God's work, honestly, with the squad. Like his subs, his starters, everything is perfect. Only thing I want for Italy is to start uh, Chiesa from the get-go. Like he showed the last two matches. Like he's really flying high, you know. Uh, and maybe, maybe Lucatelli, you know, but I don't mind. But the only start I would do is Chiesa and it's going to be a really, like, very hard game, but I feel like in the end, it is going to go through. Joe? I, I think you have, to, you have to back Belgium to go through in this game because, uh, you know, as good as Italy have been, uh, you know, they have, you know, haven't quite played a team that, you know, that they're up against it yet. And I know that's, like, I don't want to be like the Gary Neville in the room is like writes them off because they haven't played a good team. You know, they have played the best football of the tournament and, you know, they are clearly a really, really good team. And so, you know, if they go through, I'm not going to be surprised. And actually, I mean, I'm, I'm probably rooting for Italy in this just because, you know, I like the way they play. Uh, you know, they're a fun team to watch. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I have to, you have to go with Belgium just because, you know, I mean, they are the, the big favourites now. Like, you know, they have they have this golden generation for ages. You know, they're going to win something. I think it has to be this time. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got Belgium going through, uh, but I think it will be like on penalties or something or like extra time. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting because throughout this whole podcast, we've kind of discussed the idea of star power versus team like cohesion and stuff like that. And you see, obviously, I'm not saying Belgium 
on like a good team like together but Italy it's weird with Italy it almost feels as if they're a club team they seem so I don't know if it's because like the majority of them play within Italy but they seem so like yeah they seem so cohesive they seem so like at one with each other and they seem as though like they're so yeah like it seems like they play with each other every single week, not just during tournaments and international breaks. They seem like they spend every like minute of every day together. They seem seem that well well knit and so so well drilled. But yeah, then you've got the opposite side of Belgium, who maybe look like that a bit, but not as much. And will their star power with um, Lukaku, De Bruyne, Tielemans, Hazard, you know the big names, will that show? Will that shine through? And it yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, um, me and some say Italy. Um, Joe says Belgium, but it really is on a knife edge. Um, two teams um, here who maybe, maybe, maybe not Denmark, but Czech Republic definitely. I don't think they expected to get this far. They obviously overcame a, a somewhat difficult obstacle against uh, um, the Netherlands in the last round. Um, this will be an interesting game, especially as an England fan, because I'm uh, sort of I kind of want Czech Republic to win because we've beaten them before, and I feel as though they'll be a bit easier than Denmark, but. Um, yeah, it'll be an interesting game. And uh, I'd say Denmark have probably got the quality to go through. You see their bat line of Christensen, Vestergaard and Kier. That looks solid with Schmeichel behind them. Their midfield's good. Damsgaard's looking good. And yeah, they're scoring a lot of goals, four against uh, Wales and was it four against Russia as well? Um, so yeah, I'd say Denmark are going through. Samir, Joe, do either of you feel any differently or...? Uh, no, I, I think Denmark got this. Uh, actually, in Denmark have been one of the best teams at this tournament. Uh, you know, if they're obviously like really unlucky in the first game against Finland. You know, that never should have been played out. I think. Um, you know, and then the second game against Belgium, they were really, really good. And then Belgium just like brought on De Bruyne and Hazard or whatever it was, and then it was just like, you know, they, they got the job done. And then, um, and you know, the last game against Russia, they were. They're incredible, you know. I thought it was one of the best like games I've seen, just because like Denmark were so passionate and like so together and like you know just attack, attack, attack. It was great to watch. And uh, their victory against Wales, uh, I don't know how you feel about this map, but like that gave me immense joy to see Wales absolutely ripped to shreds. And like, what's his name? Um, it was it was his name, the guy with a lot, Robbie Savage. You know, him greeting at the end and everything. It was just it was beautiful. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, the Czech Republic, uh, they were really good against Scotland, but that's because Scotland are really shit. Um, and they're, and they're, they're good against the Netherlands, and that's because the Netherlands were really shit. And, you know, what do the Netherlands and Scotland have in common? They both failed to beat each other in the warm-up matches. So, you know, I think against a proper team, it should be, it should be done. Um, Denmark, Denmark's going to do it. I feel like the team is together, you know, they are very cohesive. And the Ericsson incident, unfortunately, but it, it kind of, you know, like, helped them be better, you know? Like, I feel like they're doing it for Ericsson, you know, like, they're going it, they're, they're kind of playing it for him, you know? I feel like they want to win this tournament for him, you know? Like, those kind of things, either makes you weak or stronger. I think they are, like, in their team, they're playing, you know, like, like much better than expected. And, yeah, they, they can easily go through. Nothing against the Republic, but then, yeah, Denmark is playing really well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. There's, like we say, no disrespect to the Czech Republic. They put up a good fight against England, obviously beat Scotland and drew Croatia, who got to the World Cup final three years ago. So they're not, they're nowhere, and obviously beat Holland. So they're nowhere near a bad team. But yeah, Denmark, they're on fire at the moment. And overall, I think they've got a better team and they'll go through. The final one is obviously one that I'm uh, heavily invested in. It's Ukraine versus <laughs> England. Me and Samir were having a bit of a chat before it um, about it before the pod. And it's kind of like there's a balance. I'm confident that England will win. I think England will win. And then there's the other side of England fans who seems to have this sort of delusion and arrogance that we're already through. And I, th- I mean, Samir were kind of talking about the difference between that and I think that England and I think that England on paper and based on like the Germany game and stuff like that, England should go through and it'll be a massive disappointment if England don't go through and capitalise on this sort of good run to a potential final. Um, And yeah, I think that England, the quality will shine through and I think we'll do it. I don't think it'll be like an amazing 5-0 or something like that, but maybe a 2-0, 3-1, something like that. Um, and yeah, Ukraine have been good. Um, they put up a good fight against Holland. I um, remember that game was like one of the first games, and they made it really interesting. And we're unlucky to lose. 
they've showed brilliant resilience against Sweden and like held on um, and like managed to get a late winner. And um, yeah, that England again, there seems to be this arrogance from England fans, which there usually is that England are through just because Ukraine don't have Kane or Sterling or Rashford or Foden or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, um, um, yeah, with England, I think I think England should have this this game. Sorry, I mean, obviously, you know, there's there's no comparison in terms of the squads. You know, Ukraine has some good players. Uh, you know, and they play well. You know, Shevchenko has got them like, you know, really um, well drilled, and they're playing really good football. Um, or like for the resources they have, but I, I do think that. Um, yeah, I mean, as much as I'd like to see Shevchenko put England out, I, I don't think it's going to happen because like, Ukraine are just, you saw again against um, Sweden that they were they were just completely, um, you know, they were really tired towards the end. Uh, you know, and it was, you know, partly to do with the red card that Sweden got that they went through. So I think, I, I think England should have this game. Sorry, I mean, if they don't, it's going to be like, you know, I think the the term national disaster sort of gets thrown around too much. But I think, I think uh, even f- yeah, as much as the sort of the English arrogance of the it was a like guy Mowbray at the end of the Germany game where he you know he was like creaming himself as if like they'd won the World Cup. It was really funny. Um, but like you know, um, as funny as it would be to see them you know really play well against Germany, deservedly go through and then come up against Ukraine and then shit the bed. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think we've got England going through, but Denmark should give you guys a game. So, um, this, this is going to be my saddest prediction. England's going to win it, I feel like, but then I don't want them to win, like, at all. Like, I'm sorry, Matt. I, I, I just don't like the fan base. It's just freaking cringe, man. Like, I don't know why they hype their players so much. They won, like, one World Cup, like, Hundred years ago, like since like my my dad even didn't my dad is like fifty six he didn't see another you know, win like like bro you won one thing like hundred years ago like calm down your team did not win anything like even with the golden generation with Beckham Rooney and all that like they never performed ever always underperformed but I feel like against sadly against Ukraine they will win it like they will win it but then I don't want it to but then I feel like yeah. Also, they're, like, very lucky there. They got, like, compared to the left side, the right side is a bit easier, to be honest. Even if they beat Ukraine, they have Denmark. So, it's like, yeah, England's going to win it. I just, I just don't want it. I have a grudge against them. Yeah, I just, uh, never mind. Matt, anything to say? Yeah. Sorry. I, like I say, I, I understand what you say about that because, like, I, as I've said before, I think when Rid was on the other day and Naeem, for every one England fan like myself who just likes England because I'm from England and I think we might win a few games. There's a million England fans who think that the minute we're in a major tournament, we won it without even playing a game. So yeah, I can understand that the that you don't really like that it's coming home brigade and stuff like that. So um, yeah, but that said, I don't think it is arrogant to assume that we're better than Ukraine. Um, it's arrogant to assume that we'll win 10-0, but I, think, I don't think it's arrogant or big-headed or anything to assume that we'll get through and yeah I think the bigger the bigger test will be against uh, say Denmark go through as we will predict to the Denmark side who are just on fire at the moment and obviously got the motivation from the uh, the incident that happened with Ericsson that'll be when and obviously if England get past that and reach a final the Denmark in the game against Italy Belgium Spain whatever whatever that may be those will be the really difficult games but uh, yeah this one as I said it won't be easy we won't walk through it we won't just win 10-0 but I think we've got enough to enough quality and uh yeah enough tactical wellness and uh yeah we'll, we'll just be good enough to go through um so yeah that would set come um, off. yeah go on joe that's right yeah uh, and the, the one thing i, I wanted to, to ask you actually is uh, how are you feeling about the way gareth southgate's got this team sort of set up because i, I mean i watched the game against this germany and it seemed to me like gareth southgate was just really afraid to put any creative players on like, he put Jack Realish on eventually, but, like, you know, where is Foden? Uh, you know, Foden, I think, is your best player, I think, in my opinion. I think he's great. Yeah. He's one of, like, the, you know, one of those players that he's, you know, he's not like a, you know, like a, you know, he's not like a sort of, you know, a sort of talented player, like, say, like, you know, you always say Scotland have a couple of good players like Kieran Tierney. You know, Kieran Tierney is a great talent, but, like, Phil Foden's, like, 
a really, really, really good tap. And you know, they, they, uh, and I just watched that game, and it's like, I think England wanted Germany to come at them, and Germany wanted England to come at them. So it was like a really weird game. <laughs> but like, yeah, I think, yeah. What do you think of the way Southgate's got this this going? Because I think he's got, I think he's got the wrong setup for England. Yeah, I think it's a weird one because it is frustrating when you see. Phillips and Rice there instead of maybe, like we say, Bellingham or Mount. And then you see um, maybe Trippier instead of like, I don't know, Reese James or something like that. And um, people like Saka and Sterling getting ahead of uh, Sandra and Grealish. Honest to God, it is frustrating. And you want to see like all our talent on display. But until it goes completely wrong, I don't think I could slag it off too much, if that makes sense. I can obviously be, I can have my opinion that it's, not getting the best out of our team but if we like win the Euros or get to a final I can't be too negative about it but yeah it is frustrating that because it worked against Germany it worked beautifully it worked perfectly and we beat them and we're through and they're out but yeah the fact that we like matched up with them because they play their free at the back which uh yeah they play their free at the back and the fact that we were at Wembley with 40,000 England fans and like we against a shaky Germany team, the fact that we sort of resorted to, um, yeah, sort of like we're not going to play our best team. We're going to play the team that kind of is best against you. That that is disappointing because if you see like like the best teams in the world, like Man City, they don't change their tactics to play against Man U and Liverpool. They don't change from a gegenpress press and a pressing system to a five at the back defensive part of the bush to play against Man City. Like the best teams, they have their best players and they play against they play against other good players and they just use their best team and they have this sort of confidence and this sort of, not arrogance, but yeah, confidence is the right word for it, that they can get through and they will get through playing their way. And um, yeah, it's disappointing that there's not always that consistency and that we seem to sort of go into a shell and sort of have this sort of inferiority complex that we have to play and we have to change for other teams it is a bit annoying but yeah it's it's not at the point yet where it's in a critical or fatal position because obviously we're doing well so but yeah if it's going well at the moment but I think I'll be in a position more to criticize it say like if we lose to Ukraine or lose to Denmark but yeah it's it's a bit frustrating but at the moment it's going well so I can't be too critical of Southgate who's been our best manager for like what since Terry Venables in 96 or Bobby Robson in 1990 so yeah it's a bit it's a bit frustrating but I can't go too harsh on someone who's delivered as a semi-final and like hopefully a final and maybe a trophy yeah so it's not not the end of the world at the moment yeah I mean, I, I think this the, the whole thing, you know, like I said, is quite interesting because I, I also think Scotland had like the exact same problem. I also say we've got much less good players than England, you know, we're rarely shit. But like, you know, we had, you know, players like, you know, David Turnbull, like didn't get a single minute in the in the Euros. James Forrest, you know, only got a couple of minutes against uh, the Czech Republic, you know, in the last game where we had, you know, um, Steve Clark was like bringing on, you know, uh, was it Ryan Patterson from Rangers? He's like a right back. He's like 20 years old. It doesn't even start for Rangers. Yeah. You know, the only reason he made that substitution was so that like the daily record wouldn't smash him in the morning. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is, I think it's like a British thing that they have this sort of national sort of idea that, you know, you know to lose a football match is like the end of the world. So, like, no other country has this idea. It's like they all just go and we're just going to try and win. Uh, you know, we're just going to play our best football. Yeah. Like, you know, like a Ukraine, like a Denmark, you know, they're just playing, you know, they're just they're playing their best game. You know, they give a shit, they go out. Yeah. You know, and I think if England did that, they could be one of the best teams in the world. I think they're like a tier below yeah. that at the moment because of that. Um, you know, even for they've got better players than they have had for a while. I mean, I didn't say the players they have now are probably maybe even better than like the gen- the golden generation. Mm-hmm. So it's that's where it was, where, you know, it's just a bunch of celebrities really in that right. team. That you know are good, but like, you know, <laughs> they kind of been a golden generation if they they didn't win anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's true what you say. Like, there's nothing wrong with being pragmatic. Some of the best managers of all time, like Arrigo Sacchi, Jose Mourinho, like they played this sort of. They relied on their defense and they played this football. And like Capello, they relied on this um, sort of. They they had good defensive. They had strong defensive, strong goalkeepers at a point where. Um, 
yeah, they can rely on defence to a strong degree. Um, but there's that. But then there's there, there shouldn't be, it's either really attacking or really defensive. It shouldn't be like that. There should be room for to be brave and to be uh, to explore and to, you know, sort of get the best out of our attacking players. And yeah, I think it's a shame that at times it does seem as though Southgate is perhaps too on the pragmatic and defensive side. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a shame. But again, if if we beat Ukraine tomorrow, beat Denmark on Wednesday and like maybe win something, it's not the end of the world. And then at that point, I feel as though Southgate's um, immune from uh, critici- criticism and um, yeah, and in- like a mass inquiry in the Sun or the Daily Mail or something like that. But yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation as an England fan and as a Scotland fan. It's uh, I can imagine it's never simple either. <laughs> um, I think that's it. If anyone else has got anything to add, or should we wrap it up? Yeah, I just wish England be all the very bad lot. Cheers, Samir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I might double down with that. I mean, it's not the most dislikable England team that have ever existed. Like, you know, I, I, I definitely would have hated the, you know, the sort of Stephen Gerrards and Frank Lampards, you know, like, no, fuck them. Uh, but, like, you know, there's some likable players like Foden. I thought it was likable until he tried to make himself look like Gaza from, was it, 96? Yeah. Um, that, that kind of pissed me off a bit. Um but to be honest, like, the, the only garage I really have against England is like the whole sort of the sort of media sort of thing attention they get. Like even in the games that aren't about England, like it would be yeah. I swear it was like in the Denmark v Wales game halfway through. You know they, they don't want to talk about Denmark v Wales. No. Yeah, they just want to get to the real juicy stuff, which yeah, is yeah. you know right. who's going to play against um, Germany. Yeah, you know, that's the only thing I have against them. Um, you know, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't really be too harsh on them, but yeah, I hope you guys get pumped by Ukraine. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, obviously I don't hope that that's the case, but I can understand the frustration at our uh, terrible media. But um, yeah, I think that that's the end of the podcast, really. We've gone through a lot of stuff Euros-wise. There'll be more Euro stuff and more Milan stuff coming up. Uh, yeah, this has been episode 12.5, been joined by Joe and Samir. Hopefully next time we might have a full house with Rid and Naeem coming back. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Make sure to like, subscribe and yeah, thanks for watching.